Alright, time for another draft science video presentation and such. So this is a Franklin Who video that I will respond to. The subject is ether versus no ether, uh, waves versus particle. Um, is there some <clears throat> better experiment than Michelson-Morley interferometer bullshit um, to be able to um, discern whether this we can answer this question? Now, I'd argue I've already pretty well demonstrated that all of the wave uh, philosophy <laughs> um, is destroyed by <clears throat> debunking essentially the double slit experiment and the idea that the somehow the um, energy is interfering with itself in space before it gets to a target. I think I've demonstrated that the more reasonable explanation is is that the force has to get to the target and what happens at the target is interesting but it has nothing to do with interference it just has to do with whether or not energy can be understood when it's in phase or out of phase and yes phase is important but phase isn't just a wave phenomenon it's a phenomenon of anything that happens at a frequency whether it's a pendulum swinging pendulums can be in phase or out of phase um, so lots of mechanical devices that don't have anything to do with waves have something to do with phase <laughs> um, just even talking um, frankly the, the origin of the sound not the waves so it's an interesting question. He's, um, you know, he through our conversation sort of got the idea that maybe he could prove it through this mechanism. Um, I, you know, I have in, made some effort to point out that I don't think he can prove it this way. But anyway, <laughs> it's a, it's an argument worth having. Um, and uh, so I will uh, attempt to explain what's being argued. So clearly uh, antenna uh, sending a voltage, okay, and that's just a, you know, it can be a square on off signal or it can be a wave signal that you send in where the voltage is, you know, changing or, you know, uh, periodically or it could just be noise you send in, you know, all kinds of, you know, completely screwed up signal. Um, can't quite see that. But anyway, Oh, I guess I might as well do this. Alright. Um, <clears throat> so you send something in. This is and so this is just how many electrons, right? So I could just take a square wave and I could just say, what is that really? Well, it means it's this many electrons, right? A million, a million, 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 zero. Million, 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 million zero. Um, and so it it's you can it looks like it has a shape but there's no shape in the sense it's just the shape of volume it's just how much are you sending so if it was a sine wave it would be you know 10 and then 50 and then 100 and then 1000 and then 900 and then 807 you know it go down so it's just the number of electrons you're sending okay <laughs> into the wire or in terms of pressure it's a kind of it's just the pressure that's actually going through it's not actual electrons but it's how much pressure that pushes an electron a certain amount, blah, blah, blah. So it's a quantity that you're putting into the wire or into the antenna. And um, so I guess I might as well do it that way. I might as well just show it as, so he's saying, okay, I can send a square wave, <coughs> uh, <coughs> square pulses of energy. <coughs> and then can I receive square pulses on an antenna? Well, <coughs> my argument was is that, well, all the antenna is going to say is, on off that's all it's going to see there either is it either gets hit or it doesn't get hit and has to get hit at this frequency so the idea would be is if you're sending a million here this would be the same frequency and then this would be the same frequency and then this would be the same frequency right all of these would be pairs okay because the, the whole idea is that the surface has to be hit by pairs it has to be hit by things at least pairs you know it might be even more than that it might be triple kits you know but it has to be hit at these specific time intervals so the pendulum is very sensitive you know you're you're going to try to put energy into a pendulum okay it's swinging and it's really specific i mean you have to hit it just when it's going this way you know to get the energy into the pendulum you know and if it's a little bit off 
you're not going to get as much energy in. The pendulum isn't going to hit the little bell over here, and it's not going to say green photon. You know, it's going to say something else. Um, you know, if you don't put the energy in exactly, you know, this um, sequence. And so the sequence is just a. These are just pairs of of pieces of energy, and those pairs end up being called what we call a photon. That's a photon. Okay, it's a it's more than one, it might be three. You might actually have three of these pairs to actually have what's called a photon. So then you have to extend another line to here. And these three match. And then these three match. You know. And these three match. But that's all you're sending is a volume at <coughs> a time interval. So from the perspective of whatever you're going to hit, all the atom is going to see is this, this, this. It's not going to see square wave, it's not going to see any of that stuff. Now, you can recreate that in the sense that you can, if, if you're close enough, you can tell how much volume you had. Um, you know, what the volume of, of photons were for a period and then there were no, no volume. Um, but yeah, it's not, you're not going to be able to do it with a receiver. Now, you might be able to do it with a transformer. I really should have uh, made a proper eraser. Uh, well, we'll just dry erase this time. Uh, all right, so um, back to the fundamental argument. So I'm arguing that um, obviously there's no waves traveling through space. They can't interfere with themselves. It's made out of bits of force. Force doesn't interact with force. And this phenomenon is um, because the universe is made out of energy, okay, and if an electron moves, so the energy is hitting the electron constantly from all directions. Everything in the universe is sitting in this position where it's just got stuff coming at it at all kinds of different rates. You know, this piece is back here and this piece is real close. It's almost going to hit, you know, all kinds of rates of impact. And all the electron can do, really, okay, is something extra hits it from this direction and it moves in that direction. And when it moves in that direction, it means it's going to take this stuff that was at a different time periods and it's going to make that stuff happen closer together so it's going to take it's going to take energy moving like this you know coming towards it and it's going to move into that energy and what it's going to do is compress it that is it's going to reflect it like that into a little clump it's going to compress it all right <laughs> and through that compression process it's creating these photons you know this regular frequency um you know it, uh, by doing that a few times, you can see it creates a few clumps, a few places where the energy is uh, clumped. And that clumped energy can do this thing, you know, and create a photon that is hit in a regular period. And that's what's traveling through space. And that this, these little bits of energy never hit each other. They, and if they do, it doesn't matter because they just do, you know, this basic energy thing. They just bang right into each other and reflect, which looks exactly the same as not hitting each other. The universe looks the same. So they don't do any interacting that has any significance unless they interact with matter. Matter is the only thing that can change the force, and the only thing the force can change is the position of the matter. And that's all that can take place in the universe. All right, so that's a, a premise you don't have to believe, um, but it gets to this core of what a particle model is claiming. Now, he could say particle models have some other um, function, but that's the function I'm going to defend, and that's the particle model I'm going to defend. Um, and I don't know what his, I can, you know, his wave model is kind of made out of really big things, you know, uh, uh, positrons and electrons, you know, in a you know, connected to each other, so the really big things, I know, I argue there's no way ether's going to work with those big giant things in the way, so, so you've got no chance of making a straight line anywhere, but anyway, so the other part I would say is the antenna, if you're looking down at the antenna, as I just said in the last video, I'm saying this antenna, okay, how the electrons are created, that is how they move, is in this kind of funky way, they move they move by popping, okay, out this way, and then popping out this way, and popping out this way, and popping out this way. So it has a, 
it has what you could say is a one side looks different than the other side this side's opening this side's closing this side's going this way this way this way the electrons are moving and this one's moving this way this way and this way the way it's moving is different on those two sides moving towards from one side moving away from the other side you could argue um, because the electrons popping out of the surface at an angle um, <clears throat> not straight out and therefore that's why we have that's why compass needles do this lining up thing is because there's one side does look different than the other it's producing a different kind of energy profile than the other side um, <clears throat> but the key fact is is that all it's doing is pushing so it's pushing in this direction that is it took forces that were coming in and it compressed them okay and it compressed this way it create, creates a co compression it moves into the force and when the force reflects off the electron, the electron is now pushed it into a smaller container. And it'll just keep doing that. If I keep pumping energy in, it'll keep compressing, creating little compressions that go off into space. And the little compressions have a direction, you know, based on the fact that the, the angle that the energy was pushed out at. Um, <clears throat> All right, so that's probably enough. So this clump, you know, can be seen as having pieces, all right, that are going to be at a frequency. So it's already more than one photon in a sense, even though it's making one photon, sort of. It's making it in, in, <coughs> in clumps that contain more than one photon. Um, it's more than one action. So one electron moving can make more than one photon, lots of photons, maybe 500. If the electron is moving far enough, fast enough, it'll collect a whole bunch of force and compress it, uh, compress a whole bunch of photons into higher energy photons. All right, now what is necessary to get to here? So um, the experiment that Franklin's doing, um, he has the antennas, you know, really close to each other. Okay, so all the energy, essentially, lots of the energy hits this other anten antenna because of the inverse square law. He's put, you know, one satellite, you know, thousands of times closer than all the other satellites. And is saying, look, I get a much louder signal from this satellite. <laughs> well, yes, of course you do. Um, so that's essentially a transformer. So he's sending a wave of, of amplitude, uh, you know, it, and because it's so close he doesn't have to filter it out of a bunch of other signal so the noise from the rest of the universe is 50 percent 25 percent 10 percent of the noise the antenna is going to receive he's so overwhelming it with one signal that you don't have to pull the signal out of the noise you just have to sit there and measure the absolute voltage so all he's just saying is, is if i measure the absolute voltage on the antenna I can see this wave. Well, of course you can, because 90% of what the antenna is receiving is electricity, you know, from the universe, impulses from the universe. 90% of them are coming from your antenna, okay? You're, you're sending a whole bunch of energy at the inverse square law right next to it, and the rest of the universe is, you know, can't compete with how loud this thing is. So this thing is really loud. It's like having the speaker right next to somebody's ear and then saying, why can't you hear the bells over there? And why can't you hear the, you know, of course you're not going to hear anything else. You're just going to hear whatever's in the speaker. And um, so that's not really what radio reception is. Now, whether it's a valid test to say that transformers transmit waveforms, well, sure they do. Um, but even transformers do it a little sloppy just because they're dependent on creating a magnetic tie between these two sources. And the magnetism doesn't move as quickly, you know, so it has, it, it dampens whatever signal you put in. But this, there's no damping because you didn't create a bunch of uh, metal and make it magnetic to transmit the signal, so it's even less dampened. Um, so can you tell anything from that? wave particle. Well, you really can't because the 
like I said, the particle, <laughs> the particles are still doing this. They're still saying I'm just sending pairs of energy, okay, photons, um, and that's going to make voltage in the in the antenna. And, but you're just sending so much that of course you can see that it's a square wave because you're controlling how many photons. This is a million photons, and this is zero photons, and this is a million photons. I mean, you're sending a whole bunch of them, and you're sending them consistently. And yeah, of course you can measure it from a foot away. The trick is, is that in the real world, when you're receiving um, radio signals, uh, are, um, I don't know, let's see, I, I mean, if we did the experiment with light, that would be another comparison. Um, see, because we're filtering, we don't, we, don't, we don't filter out like green light, blue light, red light, you know, in terms of tuning it in. We just say, is there visible light usually? So we give a whole range of frequencies is okay. Um, but let's say that's what you were trying to do is send a signal in a specific um, light. Well, anyway, you can just see, if you just think about it as being light, he just has a light bulb really close to a, a, a photo uh, multiplier, you know, a detector of light. And he's just saying, well, yeah, of course, this signal is going to be so overwhelming. I can pick up any changes, any fluctuations. I'll be able to measure exactly the same voltage on here. And that's not terribly surprising. So, But the trick is, is that when you're doing real radio reception or light reception, you have an antenna that's really far away. And there's lots of other sources. There's sources of light all kinds of places, sending all kinds of patterns of light to your antenna. And now you have to see one light bulb and exclude all the other light bulbs. And what the light bulbs really are is this one's a little bit redder. You know, this is red and this is red plus and this is green and this is blue. You know, they're all sending a different signal. And you really want to just pull one color out of all of the signal, all of these light. You want just the one color. And to do that, you have to hook up a radio receiver. You know, uh, you have to have a reception circuit. And that reception circuit is basically just going to do the pendulum thing I talked about before. It's basically just going to create an oscillator, okay, that <clears throat> will harmonically, you know, in residence, vibrate at the same frequency you're trying to pull out of the system. So if your oscillator says, I only oscillate at 500 megahertz, you know, nanometer, uh, light is the only one that's going to make me oscillate All right that's that's the one that pushes at just the right way that i'll swing back and forth okay you'll add energy to my pendulum if you hit it that frequency my pendulum will start swinging really <coughs> violently um <clears throat> so then you can pull that one frequency out of the signal but really all you're doing is you can't pull the waveform out unless it's a really strong signal again it has to be really strong signal for you to be able to tell because that really the the, the oscillator is just going to tell you that a million photons hit and it's not going to really give you the discretion to say the million was you know five fifty here for, you know five hundred thousand and then two and then one and then five and four and eight you know whatever it's not going to let you break down that 1,000 hits into, you know, what they did over time. It's just going to tell you that in one second I got hit by 1,000. And that's all it's going to matter to the oscillator. Or in one millionth of a second I got hit by 1,000. So it's just, you know, it's not going to say the 1,000 was in this shape or this shape or in this shape. It's not going to care about the shape of the 1,000. It's just going to say 1,000. So I don't think you'd ever be able to decipher the original wave shape of the carrier because the oscillator doesn't do that. It's not going to give you that information. Now, whether it's still in the space when it's traveling, <clears throat> well, I guess it sure it is to some extent. It's going to get messed up because we know that some of these radio waves are going to reflect off something to get to the antenna. You know, <laughs> so, you know, they're they're going to be at different points in the wave. So, you know, you're sending something that looks, let's say, like this. And what's going to happen is a piece that's, that matches here and here, 
okay, this photon is ending up taking a different path. And so when it shows up, it's going to end up being in this location and this location. You know, it's going to end up showing up at the same time energy in here, this location and this location showed up. This is going to be in phase. And that's where all this phase stuff becomes important because all you're really doing is you're saying these different pieces of it <coughs> can travel all kinds of different distances. But as long as they show up with the right phase, that is to create the right order of impacts, um, it's okay. So you'll end up moving energy from one place where there was little energy to places where there was high energy and places with a high energy to low energy. So this waveform is going to get really broken by the time this antenna has to decipher it because some of it took longer paths to get to the antenna. So that's another argument why it's irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> but um, so what else is there to say? So uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, it's just, you know, I don't think we fundamentally disagree um, in terms of what's causing the effect, which is electrons moving. Okay. Um, and the, but the real question is, is whether they're just moving energy that somehow they're hitting other big things, other electrons. So his theory essentially is electron moves into a sea of electrons and it pushes on the electrons and the electrons are connected to each other in space. And then when it gets to the antenna, that push goes into this electron. So you really don't need any forces at all because you're just pushing big things into big things. Um, <clears throat> Now, I'd say there's just no evidence that all these heavy things exist in empty space, that there's any kind of electrons out there, that there's any mass out there in that kind of volume. Um, it just, frankly, doesn't work. There's too much mass to move. Um, and that, yeah, the simple answer is, is that there is these little bits of force that are mo doing all the moving, really, in the universe. They're the thing with the momentum. Um, and they move the speed of light. And all you do is change positions of things. You move an electron, you're moving what it's reflecting. And as you move where it's reflecting, you, remove, you change what it's going to hit. So if I want to move this object, I just move another object in its direction, and I'll end up hitting it with more force. So all objects have to do is move in space to change what's reflecting off of them, and therefore what's going to impact something else. And so matter doesn't really hit matter. Um, it's all just a game between everything material, electrons and protons, are just throwing off energy. And, <laughs> you know, they have a, a cushion of energy around them. And those, those cushions of energy are the only things that really interact. This cushion hits this surface, creates reflections. The reflections basically tell the matter it has to go that way or this one has to go this way but they really never get to hit each other because as they get closer and closer you can sort of understand the ping pong paddle thing with the ping pong ball um, as they get closer and closer there ends up being almost an infinite potential to create energy because you can go from 50 you know or 10 impacts per second to 1 million impacts per second I mean huge increases in energy just by moving from this position to this position you know they get closer together the energy hits more and more often and um, you know unless they're moving really fast they can't move faster than that force gets stronger the force will create these increases in impacts and the impacts are all uh, motivation to move away you know it's momentum real momentum so there has to be a counter force that can overcome that millions of pounds of pressure, so to speak, pushing them apart. The only way they won't move apart is if there's a ton of pressure pushing them together. But that would require almost an infinite amount of energy to overcome the energy of one little force bit bouncing between two electrons. When the electrons are really, really close, it's you'd almost need an infinite amount of energy to push them closer because the one little ping pong ball is hitting so many times um, that it's a huge, gigantic amount of pressure being created by just one little piece of energy. Uh, all right, um, anything else to say? So I guess I'll play his video just to be fair. Um, but yeah, I just don't think it's going to get to the heart of the question. I don't know if anybody has any ideas about actual experiments that could um, get to the 
the substance of this. I mean, I haven't, to tell you the truth, I haven't thought about it that much. I mean, my goal is merely to get rid of these notions of, of the fact that forces interact with forces, whether you call them uh, waves or you call it a medium or whatever, that it just doesn't happen. That Whatever the ether, you know, if you want to even have an ether, it just can't mean anything because we know that the energy goes from one place to another place and that it does have this impact of reflecting that it has to everything's in this um you know you have this conservation of movement in a sense and uh, <clears throat> uh con cons conservation of momentum and there's just it really just doesn't make any difference how you're communicating the momentum i mean i think it makes a difference just in having a right answer and a wrong answer but i don't see how a medium helps at all it doesn't <clears throat> it doesn't create more options and one of the basic rules is is that a medium would have to have a geometry and the geometry would mean that you're like a checkerboard you're you don't have equidistant lines anymore you know the the medium's not going to provide the the consistency we see in reality where it doesn't matter whether i move light you know 2 inches this way or 2 inches that way or 2 inches that way it's always the same distance and so it's always the same amount of time. So how could it be a medium? Because if it was a medium, a checkerboard, this would take longer. You know, the diagonals would take longer. All right. And such. This is a short video to show the uh, waveform that is being transmitted uh, this is kind of neat. Uh, so he's got a little function generator that just makes waveforms, which is you know, it's nice that he has one with dials. <laughs> you know, uh, I had one just had dip switches, but yeah, I have to go look through my stuff. Does get received at the receiver. So what I've done is I have built a dipole antenna, and I built it on this uh, this uh, yardstick here, and we just have uh, two pieces of wire, one going this way. One going that way as a classic dipole antenna, and on the other side we have another another set of wires, uh, which act as receiver. So you can see they're very close, which is essentially just making a very crude transformer. So he's just really saying, I got a coil of wire here. I'm going to put another coil next to it. I'm going to send a signal into this coil, and I'm going to receive it in this coil. So he's not doing any radio reception. He's just measuring voltage, crude uh, wattage. He's just saying, how many watts did I shoot out? And how many watts can I collect? And obviously, if I shoot a signal that has a shape, that is, it goes from, you know, it goes 500 watts and stays there, and then goes down, then goes five, nothing, and then goes 500 watts, and then nothing, you know. Or if I made a shaped, you know, 200 watts, 300 watts, 400 watts, 500 watts, da, 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 I can, the 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 other side of the transformer is going to be able to see that wattage change it's the light bulb gets dimmer and brighter it's going to say yes dimmer brighter dimmer brighter okay it will be able to see that but if you attempt to do radio reception that is you take some distance to try to pick out the signal you're not going to be able to do it that way you're not going to be able to take its total voltage you know how much how much total wattage how much total light is hitting me total light won't pull out the signal okay uh the radio tower, you know, shooting 77 megahertz is going to be just as loud as the one shooting 110 megahertz. The brightness isn't, you're not going to be able to use brightness as a way of detecting a signal. You have to pull, filter your signal out of the other signals. You can't just say, what signal's the brightest? That won't work. Unless you're really close to the radio station. Then you can play the radio without tuning it in. You don't need a crystal. You don't need anything, right? I mean, if you're close enough to the transmitter, then you can just put an antenna up and play the radio. You know, just stick the earphone in your ear and it'll work. It actually will work. You can actually do that experiment. You can just make a long enough antenna so it creates, collects lots of the energy. And then just put a, uh, just connect it directly to a little speaker and stick it in your ear and you'll hear the radio. <laughs> you know, as long as it's AM. You won't hear FM, but you'll hear AM. It's exactly the same length. Now, what I'm using as a transmitter is this uh, function generator, and it can generate either uh, 
a square or a sine wave, so we can tell the difference. I like, I like this little cheap oscilloscope. I didn't think there's any chance you could get something like that for I that price. I picked this up for like 10 bucks from Amazon as a kit. And uh, what we have here is a, a cheap oscilloscope. Uh, this actually cost me about uh, 40, 30, 40 bucks. And uh, this allows me... Uh, you know, it's kind of amazing. I mean, even getting the LCD, the whole little thing in a package, uh, kind of amazing that you could get a little oscilloscope for under 50 bucks. I mean, surprises me. So maybe I'll have to go look for one of those. Me to, uh, to, to, to view what signal is coming out of this. So let's see here. So first of all, let's start. I'm going to turn off the transmitter here. Okay, so right now the uh, transmitter is not connected to the oscilloscope receiver. So what I'm first going to do is I'm going to put in, I can choose the input to put in a square wave. So let me do that. <laughs> okay, so I'm putting in a square wave, putting in the square wave output. And this is what the square, this is what the square wave looks at, looks like in the receiving antenna. Okay, so you see that? It's it's kind of square, okay? So now I'm going to switch it over to the sine wave output. And we'll see what that looks like. A little bit hard to do with holding my... So, just to understand, like I said, he's not really receiving the signal. He's just measuring the total voltage on the antenna. And because he has one antenna so close to the other, the, the, the you know every other signal in the world he's not competing with anymore so now he can just measure the total voltage on the antenna and 90 percent of the voltage is being caused by his antenna so obviously he doesn't have to filter anything out he's just going to be able to say how much energy am i getting from the transmitting antenna where if he had to filter out one frequency then he's not going to be able to see the exact amplitude of the original antenna. He's just going to be able to see the photons, the on-off, the pattern of the frequency. I found, okay, so this is the sine wave output. Now I'm going to have to freeze this signal here so you can see what it looks like. Okay, so that is the sine wave signal. So definitely different from the square. So definitely you can recover the shape of the radio wave that is being generated by transmitters whether so you really can't at a distance <clears throat> he's only be, he's only able to do that because he doesn't have to he doesn't have to oscillate some other uh signal he doesn't have to amplify it doesn't have to catch it pull it out of all the other signals and then the process of pulling it out of all the other signals you're not going to be able to see sine wave on carriers. Carriers aren't going to care. They're just caring about the fact that you vibrated a little box or whatever and it resonated at the same frequency and that's all. You're not, you're not, you're not going to be able to play a game where I vibrated and I stopped and I vibrated and I stopped and, I, and I, you know, I, put, I put a message on the vibration of the oscillator. You're just going to say how much is the oscillator oscillating and you're not going to be able to, you know, per second control the oscillation of the oscillator <laughs> you're not going to be able to tell it whether there's a match or not there is there a match no match match no match um anyway uh so again but i just don't even know if it really gets to the the fundamental argument of whether there needs to be stuff okay in the universe uh whatever and that you're just dominoing you know that you're just taking stuff in the universe and then you're moving it this way and you're moving it this way and you're moving it this way and that somehow just stuff vibrating is all you need to explain all the phenomenon i would argue that it doesn't explain it because clearly the force is much smaller okay than the matter and clearly it doesn't interact so how does it know when an electron moved and when something smaller than an electron moved Unless you want to say there's no such thing smaller than the electron, and there's just the electron moving, you know, and then you're going to say, how did it move? Because you can't really say another electron pushed it, because then you have all this stuff stuck next to each other. Then you have atoms that are have no space in them. Then there is no space anywhere. You're taking away space from everything, and I don't even understand then how you can have any kind of coherent movement over any distance, 
because everything's got to go through clunky electrons. Well, it doesn't work for me. I think the, just the basic obvious reason is clearly the space has every indication that the sun can produce a ray at any angle. It just doesn't matter. It can, it can choose any line it wants to. There's no such thing as saying there's only certain pathways that are straight. They're all straight line paths, and so there can't really be a whole matrix of clunky stuff in some geometry because then lots of straight lines wouldn't be possible. All right. Yeah, probably enough. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably enough. Probably, you know, it's an interesting subject, but um, so far, not quite. <laughs> it's, you know, unfortunately.